Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for getting into your seats after, um, after lunch. So we're going to start our next session. Um, we will have three speakers followed by a Q&A, and then there will be a coffee break at 4 o'clock. So we've got some amazing presentations to look forward to this afternoon. We're going to start with Mariana Castana, who is... Um, <coughs> how best to describe. Architect and curator based in London and Lisbon. Um, she works with, uh, and co-founded and works with a collective called The Decorators. I should be speaking into the microphone, sorry. Uh, she works with a collective called The Decorators and you may also have seen her work in the exhibition The Future Starts Here that was on recently at the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, which Mariana curated. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction and for inviting me to be here today. And, and thank you, Gabrielle, for making it so smooth. And um, uh, yeah, it's 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 a massive honor for me to to be part of, of this day. As um, Dan mentioned, I, I have a background in architecture, um, and um, I, I work as a curator and researcher, um, and I, I have this practice with uh, three other people, um, uh, Chavi Llarc Font, uh, Carolina Caicedo, and Susanna O'Connell, um, that is called The Decorators. Um, and we, together, we make public art uh, installations, and our work um, uh, often deals with engagement or uh, making cultural institutions or city councils um, engage with um, uh, non-obvious um, agents. Um, uh, but I also work as a, an independent curator um, in, in different kinds of contexts. Um, some are, are very small, um, kind of informal um, festivals, and other times I work with kind of larger scale uh, museums. And I think what, what's common to to these projects and what I wanted, wanted to, to talk to you about today uh, in relation to my practice is, um, is has to do with my interest in, in fiction and how, how I use fiction as a, as a tool to enact possible futures. Um, and I do this by using a methodology that I've started to call um, radical hospitality, uh, that is by bringing, um, convening uh, many, many, many people um, in the making and the using um, and the enacting of these um, uh, fictional propositions. Um, and that has to do with my background in architecture. So, you know, I create spaces where we can collectively think um, and, and, and play and, and critically assess um, uh, I, futures and ideas that are being presented to us. Um, Could you use the microphone, please? Oh, I'm sorry. It's here. Okay, like like this. Is it working? Okay. Um, so I was saying um, yes that I'm, I come from uh, from this architectural background. So my work manifests in spaces. Um, uh, often these spaces are collectively constructed either by um, uh, through curatorial practice or, um, as you see, the sort of hybrids between um, sort of commissioning. Uh, thank you uh, and designing um, and programming and. Um, yeah, I think this is a kind of um, a, a fiction that perhaps uh, you know is is um, maybe different from the kind of fiction that would be uh, written um, as in a novel um, uh, by one single author, or uh, it's a different fiction from from those that are created in um, in, in sort of shiny screens of production studios. Um, it's these, these, these fictions that I deal with are not perfect or finished in any way because they are a lot more messy, because it, they are, they're sort of built with, a, you know, in, yeah, normally uh, or often in real contexts with, with real people. Uh, so uh, uh, someone that's been very, very influential to me, uh, besides, of course, Dan and Ravi, <laughs> we saw Fiona uh, this morning, um, uh, has been um, a literary critic called Mary Laura Ryan. Um, and she says that the fundamental gesture of narrative fiction is one of, uh, of um, 
decentering and recentering. So imagine when a writer um, uh, creates a fiction, for example, he or she moves into uh, moves the center of the universe to a sort of parallel um, world, to a, a, an alternative world, and then uh, relocates and kind of starts living there and describes that world. And then uh, she invites the reader to be um, a citizen of this new world. When the, when the reader accepts this citizenship, then a fictional pact is created between the two. And I find this idea just a really beautiful uh, way of understanding the process, the collaborative process that is inherent to, to, to any fiction, but also um, it's an idea that is very challenging to me in terms of thinking, okay, so how um, can we even begin to thinking about like the practice of um, of, of fictional worlds or um, in, in the field of, um, you know, f with my tools of kind of, you know, special design. So I, um, I brought you some examples of um, projects in which I've attempted to, uh, to do this. Uh, they're never projects which I do alone. It's, they're, they're always in collaboration with other people. Uh, so this project, for example, you're uh, seeing here uh, was created uh, by K uh, Paulo Moreira, who is a Portuguese architect, and Kiluanji Kiahenda, who is an Angolan artist, and they've collaborated um, to create an installation in the context of the Lisbon Architecture Triennial, um, in which I was responsible for curating one of the exhibitions that was called The Real and Other Fictions. This was one installation um, um, inside a very old palace, and um, which had had a number of political uses or, you know, throughout its history. Um, and when uh, Paulo and Kiluanji um, uh, started working, they came up with this idea of um, a fictional embassy, um, an embassy that uh, wouldn't represent any uh, particular nation or any particular time. Um, and so they called it the Embassy of No Land. Um, and so they've uh, designed um, a room which was almost like the the ambassador's sort of reception room. Uh, so there, there is a throne, there is uh, the portrait of the leader, but of course they've subverted all of these elements. Uh, the portrait um, is actually is a mirror. They've uh, designed all of the elements that you would normally encounter in a setting like this, but they are um, sort of transformed um, to suit this these framework of, of an embassy that actually doesn't um, represent any land, so there's also two flags, and uh, there was also a voting booth, um, uh, surveillance uh, apparatus, uh, and other elements. Uh, but for the purpose of the conversation here, what was interesting about this project is that uh, the way that it was run. So here you see it as like a pristine room, uh, but from the day one of uh, the exhibition, um, we set up this structure in which we um, invited uh, a different ambassador every week uh, and we gave each ambassador carte blanche um, as to what to do in this space so they could completely transform the room they could organize whatever events they wanted and they could um, extend the opening hours of the the, the palace um, and so on and so forth these ambassador ambassadors that we chose were um, 11 different um, organizations they were all um, organizations that are not normally part of what are the official representations of um, of nationhood, uh, and in this context, the Portuguese nation. Um, I mean, I, I don't have time to go through them all, but um, one of them, for example, was um, a group of citizens that live in the outskirts of Lisbon today. This is 2013. Uh, this is a community of... Um, uh, illegal. It's an illegal set settlement uh, composed of many illegal citizens, uh, and they use the embassy um, as a, a headquarters uh, during a whole week, uh, where they've uh, done a number of actions to uh, demand their right to clean water, for example, in, in as part of their um, as part of uh, of their neighbourhood. Um, this was done in the context of uh, a bigger exhibition, as I, as I mentioned, or I don't know if you can call it an exhibition, but it was uh, 
a series of installations that were um, commissioned to take part for three months in this palace that had been the residency of the Marquis of Pombal, who was the person who, after the earthquake of 1755, which was, you know, the uh, it's the setting to Voltaire's Candide. It was the uh, the worst place in Europe at the time. Uh, there was a tsunami and a and an earthquake that destroyed the whole city and the Marquise was the politician who then delivered the reconstruction of the whole city. Uh, and this was, this house survived, it was his house, um, um, private home. And uh, and so when doing this exhibition, I thought it would be interesting to, 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 to again use this space um, as, a, as, as a venue from where to reimagine, um, uh, yeah possibilities for um, Portuguese society. Uh, and the way we did that was um, by um, uh, convening a number of, of practitioners uh, to each install work in a room and each um, come up with uh, an installation and a program for that installation. So uh, here you can just get a sense of um, how the different configurations of the room, one, one ended up being a um, uh, a parliament and, and it ran as a parliament in collaboration with universities and research groups. Um, another one uh, was an, uh, a continuous publication uh, that went on top on the right, so which was written throughout the three months and which engaged um, uh, independent publications um, uh, across Portugal actually that came together to, to contribute to the making of this. So, um, so here uh, I suppose um, the, the special conditions of the palace um, sort of inspired uh, a, a curatorial setup, which then, and, but, but also the architecture of the palace also uh, deeply informed the nature of the works in that they were all sort of very political programs, um, like the program of the building. In architecture, we call program, um, we, what we mean by program is the function of a building. So whether it's a hospital or a school or, uh, and this, this building is ha was an embassy, it was um, uh, uh, a legation, it was uh, the place where the anarcho-syndicalists were arrested in the beginning of the 20th century. So it had a number of sort of political significance and those uh, stories that are actual stories then ended up um, shaping the work of these practitioners that engaged with them from a perspective of um, uh, reimagining them um, in, in this new context um, and from a speculative um, perspective. So um, this is a, a, a photo of, of a project um, which I did with the decorators back in 2011. Um, and, and the reason why I, I brought it was because this was um, a very important project for us as a practice, but also uh, a project which allowed us to think um, and make sense of what we do. Um, so we create public installations, um, and this work in particular happened in the middle of a market in East London, uh, Ridley Road Market. Um, at the time, there was a lot of um, movement from people going to live in, in Dalston. Um, and uh, so new residents um, taking up um, uh, apartments in new developments. Uh, so it was an area undergoing a lot of change and there were ideas for how the market should accompany those changes that had to do with perhaps um, a more clean version of the market like Spitterfields, for example. Uh, and we were um, interested in uh, uh, in, in kind of testing for the first time our um, ideas around program and possibility in a real context. So um, we collaborated here with um, uh, Atelier Chan Chan, uh, who was um, you know, a friend of a friend who had an, a site in Ridley Road Market. This was a very tiny uh, plot in the middle of, of this incredible place that sells everything, as you can see, from eggs to vegetables and suitcases and clothes. and. Um, and uh, we decided to um, create um, a restaurant. In this, what was happening at the moment was that the new residents were all shopping at Sainsbury's and Tesco, uh, and the market traders were sort of, their, their trade was declining. Um, there had been a number of bus uh, route changes, and um, 
we uh, were quite interested in thinking that we could um, think of regenerating the market, but not uh, through um, uh, uh, urban design, but uh, through the insertion of a program. Um, and so we created this, this restaurant. The way it ran was um, um, a kind of uh, a series of steps. So we invited a different um, a chef to cook um, every day in the restaurant. Uh, we started with a 70 pound kitty and we uh, which we gave to the first chef and then from then on every time for lunch we would have a shopping list um, so the chef would write uh, you know what their next dish was going to be and and all the ingredients necessary so if you came to the restaurant you would uh, choose an ingredient from the list and go to the market um, buy two pound worth of any ingredient or bring it from your home or your back garden, whatever you, you preferred. But we would exchange the, um, the raw ingredients for a cooked meal. At night, uh, we had a system where we, we had a, a sit down dinner. We had a table for 15 people with a mechanical table that would, um, uh, so that the, uh, I can show you. So the, the, the dining area would be on top, on the top floor and the, the kitchen would be on the ground floor. Um, and so if you came for dinner, uh, we would um, uh, serve a meal for 15 pounds, five of which would then be given to you back as a voucher to encourage kind of further trade in the market. Um, so we, um, we created the whole restaurant. I mean, at the time we were sort of a, a, a obsessing about this idea that this was a market where you could find anything. So we bought like, you know, the cutlery, the plates, the woods, everything was um, sourced in, in, in Ridley Road Market. Um, and uh, we were also um, obsessed about this like perfect um, kind of circle of collaboration, thinking of the restaurant as this big system where anyone could take part. Uh, but as we learned from the traders right at the beginning, we could either, if we were in the market, we had to trade, we had to, um, uh, and so we would then at some point started to sell, to, to exchange meals in the beginning, food for food, but then food for clean water with the, uh, the you know, the, the workers from kind of Hackney, um, water supplies and so on. Uh, we started to exchange food uh, for music in the restaurant and it just became like this self-contained system. Um, of course, at the end of this project, you know, we imagined that uh, we could um, continue it. We ran the restaurant for three weeks because that's how long you can do temporary event notices in, in London. You, you can do three in a row and each one you can run for four days. So uh, we, we ran it for three weeks and at the end thought, oh, perhaps we could convince the council to buy the plot of land again and we could run it as this um, food for food exchange. And it just speaks of our naivety at the time, <laughs> thinking that, uh, that this was possible. And this was a very painful moment for us because uh, uh, we realized that we created uh, this this possibility and that we made it real for the, for that moment in time for that in that space i mean uh, it was really possible to run this restaurant uh, as with an alternative economy but then it was it it was over um and that kind of uh, was very frustrating at the beginning but then it got us thinking about you know what what does it mean to create a space uh for um, uh, we started to think about our work much more as a as a, a space where we can critically assess the the situations in which we found ourselves today, the places where we live, the, our streets, our neighborhood, and um, and we began seeing our work as having that function of of kind of showing a possibility, enacting a possibility, um, and then kind of being okay with it, just ending. Um, so then I've uh, tried to, 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 to bring uh, this way of thinking into um, different contexts. And I, I brought this uh, one because it's the strangest context in which I've ever worked. It was um, at the time I was working at the Victoria and Albert Museum and uh, the World Economic Forum was going to organize their first ever exhibition. And, um, and somehow uh, I uh, became the person that was going to be responsible for delivering this exhibition. Um, and this is a, 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 the World Economic Forum um, is perhaps, uh, and, and their encounter in Davos is perhaps the uh, 
the most uh, important meeting of like world leaders and CEOs. It's a very, very strange context. Um, it's a whole village that gets locked up um, uh, by very, very heavy security. Uh, and then there are all of these um, seminars and, and, and meeting rooms and conferences that happen in, in, in a complex. And so, of course, this exhibition was taking place in kind of the corridor of this conference. Um, and it was very much commissioned as a, an it, a part, uh, somehow a form of entertainment for the delegates going to Davos to have something to do in their break. Um, and so uh, I thought uh, this might be an interesting moment to bring in maybe some important questions that were not being discussed in Davos at the time. Um, and so I worked with um, uh, Nick Mortimer and Joseph Popper uh, and Kobe Varhard in the design of a series of dioramas uh, that um, exaggerated uh, future uh, present extreme present conditions and uh, that asked questions um, about the current state of technology so this exhibition was created as uh, uh, an exhibition um, that uh, intersected design and and technology and and kind of a speculative exhibition but uh, a bit like you know a, a trojan horse we tried to bring in some important um, uh, political conversations as well to to the forum i'll just briefly mention two works one uh one of the top which we showed um was uh, a portrait of uh, chelsea manning the at the time chelsea manning was in prison uh, still uh, for releasing um uh, classified documents uh and um and uh, this is a portrait that was created by uh, Heather Dewey Hagberg, the artist that you see here in this picture. Uh, and uh, so Heather created, she had been developing these um, portraits um, uh, that were created using um, a technology called phenotyping. So um, she would uh, collect DNA, extract information from uh, DNA, and then generate a portrait of a person based on um, certain signifiers about um, around their appearance. Of course, this is a highly speculative um, uh, practice. She had been doing it until this time with um, uh, sort of finding cigarette butts in the street and, and things like that. But when uh, Chelsea was in prison, there was a moment where Paper Mag magazine uh, did an interview or published an interview with her, um, uh, an interview to Chelsea Manning. Uh, and the interview was conducted on the phone and by letter, but they didn't have an image to show. And at this point, Chelsea had changed her gender while in prison. So there was no portrait of her as a woman. And so um, uh, at some point, someone thought, oh, perhaps we could ask Heather because she does these portraits from DNA. So, so um, Chelsea sent Heather samples from her DNA from prison, like hair and saliva, and then in her studio, Heather composed this portrait. Uh, and so uh, the portrait at the time existed as a 3D element, but we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to take this work, which is a work that is a speculative um, design project uh, about the, um, uh, the uh, proliferation of, 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 of DNA uh, technologies and this um, and, and certain pseudo uh, pseudo scientific knowledges that develop around it, uh, but wouldn't it be interesting to 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 you to take this project to, to Davos and also take the opportunity to talk about Chelsea Manning, um, and so uh, so th this this was quite interesting because uh, even while in prison Chelsea Manning was tweeting and she was um, very active on social media, so to have her portrait exhibited there was a way of almost bringing her <laughs> to Davos, uh, which, which I thought was um, quite interesting. Other works um, sort of raised also, uh, I, I suppose, important kind of political discussions. Uh, this is the, uh, an object in the V&A collection. It was acquired as part of the rapid response um, collection, and it's the, uh, the 3D printed gun. This is actually the first exemplary of the 3D printed gun. Um, uh, created by Cody Wilson in the US. Um, and so I, I should have said, in, so in, the, in, in, in Davos, uh, what I thought was interesting was um, to reflect about how uh, the engagement of CEOs, 
scientists, journalists and politicians as an audience. It's a very improbable audience for the kinds of works that we were exhibiting, sorry. Um, and uh, to, it was a very, very difficult audience to, to work with. Um, and so I suppose our aim there, and it's been w wonderful to work with uh, uh, Nick and, and Joseph on this project, uh, was to how do we uh, create this as a Trojan horse, right? As something that looks entertaining, it's exciting, but then perhaps as you as you uh, come closer to it, you'll actually be dealing with um, uh, questions that might be actually as complicated as the ones that you have been developing in the conference hall. So this idea that perhaps design um, can equally <laughs> contribute to, um, or is perhaps generating questions that uh, should have been considered in some of those forums and, and, and kind of conference halls. Uh, more recently, when I, I was uh, at the v still and created this exhibition uh, called The Future Starts Here, um, I get, uh, which I co-curated with Roy Hyde, um, we took a different approach. We were doing this in the um, context of the Department of Architecture, Design and Digital that had been created very recently um, and that had um, an approach to design uh, that was highly motivated by this rapid response collection. So this was about taking objects from their natural context, um, almost a, a, an anthropological interest in objects, everyday, um, um, everyday uh, objects, but looking at them with critical eyes. Um, an example I gave you was this um, 3D printed gun. Um, uh, another example was, uh, and actually one of the very early acquisitions was a pair of trousers, um, uh, uh, Primark trousers from the brand Primark um, after the, <coughs> the devastating fire that happened in, in um, Rana Plaza. So to take an approach uh, 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 like so, to so we were operating in this context, and um, and so we did an experiment in which we um, took objects from uh, the contexts of um, um, we created a flat hierarchy of objects that were coming from different contexts. Some were from the research labs, some were from companies, future centres, uh, private companies. Some were coming from uh, governmental um, organizations, others from independent design and artist studios. And we thought it would be interesting to put them in, in dialogue. Um, and in that sense, uh, <laughs> the, the, this was, um, and in, in the context of, of, of our discussion here today, I found that, uh, so this uh, amalgamation of objects coming from different origins and this almost, uh, you know, practice of being hospitable in that sense that we want to um, invite uh, all of these different players in, in, in our future today to come together and, um, and so that we can see them all as an assemblage and kind of have a critical discussion about them. Uh, we were quite happy with the result, but I think there is a question here which I've like lost years of life <laughs> thinking about, which is uh, the question of how critical you can be as, um, as, a, as a curator. Um, um, so, I think up until this, this point, I was working with practitioners that whose work was critical, whose work was speculative, and uh, or the work that I was doing, the speculative work that I was doing was as a practitioner. To move that um, way of thinking into a, a, an institutional context, I think um, proved to be actually much more challenging than I um, than I expected. Um, uh, and, the, and the main reason is uh, that, uh, for example, uh, you see this object here on top is a, is a drone by Facebook. Um, it's a, a, an object called Aquila. It's a, a prototype uh, that Facebook were developing at the time here in the UK in a, in a warehouse in Somerset. And it's um, a, a plane, an unmanned plane designed to bring internet to the whole world. Um, uh, the idea is that these planes, that they're solar powered, they fly for about two, three months, and then they beam internet to the ground. Now, uh, my interest in this project was um, the convening uh, in, in, conven in, in bringing this object to the context of, of, of a museum, 
was uh, the opportunity to to think about this object critically, to think about what what Facebook might mean when they create an object that wants to be global and bring internet to the whole world. It's a future where everyone is connected, and we know that Mark Zuckerberg thinks that being connected should be a human right, but it's also a future where the internet might be controlled by one single company. Now, when conveying this as, you know, as, as a curator in institutional context, um, what you can do is um, create a setting in which the this drone might be perhaps, you know, um, feel a little bit threatening, kind of floating above you all the way throughout the exhibition. You can write a label that assesses this object critically, but that's there's not much more than I that that you can do. And uh, and so at the end of this experiment, I actually wondered whether by uh, bringing objects like this one to the context of a museum like the v um, you know, does the gravitas of the museum um, give them uh, already um, uh, an acceptance and a, um, and does the context of the museum end up legitimizing the future and the vision and, you know, that this company is creating? And so is it really possible to be critical and yet create a spectacle um, is a question that, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer. And I think I've uh, probably uh, finished. Yes, that's the end of my time. <laughs> Thank you.